Um, and this is one scripture I want to share with you guys before we pray and dismiss our kids. This comes out of Jeremiah 17. Okay, have any of you guys read Jeremiah recently? Yeah, guy like to cry, right? Um, <laughs> blessed, happy is the man who trusts in the Lord. Not just knows about him or knows his word, but actually trusts him and whose hope is in the Lord. You guys remember a couple weeks ago we talked about our hope being in Jesus, that anchor to our soul. For he shall be, verse 8 tells us, like a tree that is planted by the waters. Now what is a tree going to do if it's planted right next to water? Do you think it's probably going to grow well? It's not going to thirst. Okay, It's going to constantly have something to draw from, to grow, to become big and strong. It spreads out its roots by the river so it goes deep. Okay, The winds might come and blow, but the roots are so deep and so big and long that it's not going to blow over. And it will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaf will be green. So even when it's hot and everything else around it might be dying, it's still going to be alive. It's going to be green. There's going to be life and will not be anxious in the year of drought. And I want to tell you guys, that's one of the reasons why we do ministry the way we do here at Freedom Fellowship, okay? And another pastor recently asked me, like, do you really just teach verse by verse? This is a pastor. He's a topical preacher. He preaches the word, but he's never preached just through a book in the Bible. It's something he grew up not knowing, and he sees us doing it. There's not a lot of churches that do approach the word of God this way, which all churches would just open the Bible (laughs) and just trust God's word because it's one of those things, guys, when we are grounded in the word of God, okay? We actually have to know him. And how do we get to know him? Well, he's revealed himself through his word, okay? And in that, we trust him because he is good. He is great. There is none like him. And there is something when we guys take the word of God seriously, Okay, we are diving deep and we continue to take in. We are going to trust him. I know your word. Okay, I, I'm anchored deep in your word. I have a hope that is sure that no matter what heat, no matter what comes my way in this life, no matter what storm I face, I'm going to be grounded. Nothing's going to shake me. Nothing's going to change me. I'm going to keep growing. And that's why we believe here at Freedom, we're just going to keep on in the word of God because that's what we need to keep growing and be grounded. And I want us to be a people that trust God, because that's what pleases him. Do you guys know that? So Romans chapter 8 this morning. um, I want you guys to catch this up on the screen. Uh, This is a picture from my wife. She's got a a daily planner. She doesn't plan anything in it. It's kind of like an ongoing running journal for her God's Insights. But this was really cool because last week we were looking at probably one of the most popular scripture in all of the Bible, which is Romans 8, 28, right? Last Sunday was the 29th of August, and did you guys look what the verse of the day happened to be in her journal, okay? Coincidence, right? Well, I don't think there's a whole lot of coincidences with God because afterwards we were out with a family from the church having some lunch, and there's more God coincidences that were shared. I get a text that evening that came around Romans 8, 28, more coincidences from someone else in the church. Like, things just don't happen like that, but I think God... um, likes to show that he is there, even in little bitty things like this. So isn't that kind of cool? Um, so I thought that was pretty rad. I'm like, no way, like the Sunday, you know. But then I had to tell Sunday, I actually planned that this entire year of studying Romans. I just worked out the studies perfectly so we would land there. <laughs> that would have been funny. <laughs> Anyways, we're getting... Uh, <laughs> Verses 31 to 39 this morning. Um, I want to share with you guys real quick uh, a story. Uh, Steve Winger uh, from Lubbock, Texas, he writes about his last college test on a logic uh, class known uh, to be very difficult uh, in its exams. So to help us out on our test, the professor told us that we could bring as much information to the exam as we could fit on a piece of notebook paper. Have you guys ever had a 
a teacher allow you to do that, right? You jot down as many little notes as possible. How much can I fit on that little piece of paper, right? How much information can I get on there? <clears throat> well, most students crammed as many facts as possible into that little eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. But one student walked into class and he put the piece of paper on the floor and he had an advanced logic student stand on the paper and the advanced logic student told him everything that he needed to know that was on his test. He was the only student to get an A on that exam. So the ultimate final exam comes when we stand before God. Every human being who ever has lived is living or will live, will stand before their maker one day. And God's going to ask, why should I let you in? You see, on our own, guys, we can't pass the exam. Our creative attempts, no matter how great they might be, in this life they fall short. We can't do it on our own, but we have someone who will stand in for us. Jesus Christ. So, Father, we're thankful once again for the cross as we sing. You are our substitution. We don't deserve such a gift, such a God who would humble himself and give himself for us to die in our place, that we may be forgiven of our sins. But we're so thankful that you've risen from the dead that you are alive today, that you are with us. And once again, Lord, we pray and ask that you'd really speak to us, give us understanding as we jump into this great passage here in Romans chapter 8. We ask in your name, amen. One thing I love about God is his love. And do you guys know that his love keeps on giving? Isn't that cool to think about? So this morning, we're going to have five questions as we conclude Romans chapter 8. When it comes really around, it drives home for you and I the security that we have in Christ Jesus as his kids. So the questions are, what shall we say or then say? Who shall oppose us? Who shall accuse us? Who shall condemn us? And... What shall separate us? Those are five good questions. And Paul's going to dive into these for us this morning. So the first question we find in verse 31. Okay, what shall we say then? What shall we say to these things? Well, what things? Well, I'm glad you asked. Well, what did we just study last week? What was written just before? What is the context of? of this verse what is the greater context of chapter 8 of the book of Romans as a whole well we just read about God's ability and what was his ability to work all things for the good that is the context that we saw so we also see the things that are listed in verse 30 being predestined being called being justified glorified so this is all speaking or coming around his providence so let's keep that in mind when paul is asking this question so what shall we say then in response to this awesome redemptive purpose of god well his answer provides the most really strikingly impressive probably majestic passage in all of the bible when it comes to christian assurance So some of you guys are in that place. I I don't know if where I really stand with God. I don't know if I'm really secure in the faith, in who I am in him. Well, this is about as good as it gets in the Bible when it comes to our assurance as being a Christian. So what follows forms really a foundation of solid confidence. And how many of you guys think confidence is pretty important? It is, okay? Any guys ever play sports? Okay? Is it good to have a little bit of confidence when you get out there on the field or the court? 
Maybe you played golf, the greens. I never did that. I have no confidence when it comes to golfing. But we grew up playing a lot of ball sports. And I was an okay ball player. And it was one of those things I always got on the field knowing we could win. I had that confidence. Hey, this can happen. We lost a lot. (laughs) But the confidence was there that it was enjoyable. Hey, this is something I want to do. Okay? And when you have that confidence, it's fun. You guys know what I'm talking about. Things can happen. We even see the NFL, hey, uh, you know, do they have the confidence to get back to once, you know, the the player they once were because they got hurt and it's such a mental game and a big part of playing and being successful at this level is, is your mental, you know, confidence. Well, some people never get that back, but one thing I love as a child of God, we have confidence, and it's not because of us. It's because of who he is. Does that make sense? Okay? Teaching the word of God's a pretty serious thing. Okay? Teachers will receive a stricter judgment. Okay? Whoa! I don't know if I want to do it. You know? To be honest with you guys, it's the confidence I have in God. I know who I am. I'm weak. I'm not the smartest guy around, but I know who God is. And if he asks us to do something, guys, we can have confidence because I am what I am by the grace of God. Do you guys understand that? So whatever God has set before you, whatever he's asking you to do, no matter how big or how small it is, we can find confidence in doing it because God has asked us to do it. And he's going to give us the grace to do it. So I love the questions that Paul asks here. What shall we say then to these things? So what shall we say then? Well, to this, we're secure sheep. Do you guys get that? We are secure in who he is, in his providence, that it is his deal. He is on the throne. He is in control. He's got you. Next question, who shall oppose us? Look at the rest of verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So if God is for us, if actually means since God is for us, or because God is for us, It's not a question mark, guys. It should be an exclamation point here for you and I. So the Father is for us, verse 31. If we look ahead a few verses to 34, we see Jesus is for us. And then if we look back to verse 26, the Holy Spirit is for us. God is for us, guys. So is the opposite then true? Well, if God is against you, who can be for you? And if they are for you, what does that matter? So please think that through. If you don't know this morning that God is for you, what does that mean? If he's against you, then what? And what will become of you? How will you face him? And what will become of you in eternity a lot of people don't ever want to deal with those questions well I'm an atheist or I don't believe that Jesus is the Christ the savior of the world I believe this instead so back to this who can be against us we really don't have anything to fear saints that's the point What do we have to fear? Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is the light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 56, 4. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? And again, verse 32 here, guys. He who did not spare his own son, okay? God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, 
but he delivered him up upon that cross for our sins, for us all. How shall he not with him, by doing that, also freely give us all things? So believer, do you wrongly fear that God is against you or angry with you? That's wrong thinking. That's not biblical. He not only isn't angry with you, but he is so for you. That is what Paul is laying down for you and I. This is what we need to understand and to get here. He didn't even hold back his own son for you. Think about that. That's how much he loved you. So did you hear that? Give us all things. So would God give us the greater but not the lesser? Think about that. What's greater than his only begotten son? Nothing, okay? So would he sacrifice his own son but hold his possessions from us? Do you not know that you've been giving every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus? You have all of that to possess. And how much as believers we don't enter into what God has given. As a dad, I'd be pretty bummed. Hey, I got something really good for you, son. Daughter, you'll be super blessed. (laughs) I don't believe you. (laughs) I don't want to receive it. Well, you're lost. Bummer. I love you. I really want you to have it. Guys, we need to enter into all that God has. And we receive by faith. So God is committed to freely lavish on us his continuing, unfailing generosity. Okay? I'm wearing a Live Generously t-shirt this morning on purpose. We get to do this because we have a very generous Father in heaven. And he gives us good gifts. And are those good gifts for ourselves? No. (laughs) No. We've been blessed to bless others. Do you guys understand that? We've been given much as the children of God. I've been given eternal life. I've been given a relationship with God Almighty, the creator of all things. I know Jesus. How can I not share with others? We have to give. Go. Go. My disciples, go into all the world. Share with them. Teach them. Baptize them. So, who can oppose us? Who? Who? No one. What does that mean for you and I? (laughs) We're advantaged sheep. Isn't that cool to think about? This... This is to our advantage, being a child of God. We've been blessed so much. Which brings us to our next question. Who shall accuse us? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. So a charge is to bring a legal charge against someone. So who, who accuses Christians? I think the question should be, who doesn't accuse Christians? Am I right, guys? Right, We have Satan, the accuser of the brethren who accuses them before God night and day, Revelation 12, 10. We have the world, okay, it does. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you, right? So John 15, 8. Some people really trip out. I can't believe they're saying that about me. They're against me. Read your Bible. That's life, Christian. It's what's going to happen. Well, we Christians accuse one another. It's sad, but it's a reality. If you bite and devour one another, be at least you are consumed by one another, Galatians 5, 15. How many Christians fighting with each other? You know, some of the hardest battles I've had in this life, it hasn't been from the world or even Satan. It's been from a brother or sister in Christ. It's like, seriously, We should know better. We should be better as God's children. Why are we doing this? Also, guys, uh, we even accuse ourselves, okay? 
I don't know how many people I counsel with, and they're carrying around this guilt. They're carrying around shame. Why? It's really because of pride. You guys know that? Pride and shame go hand in hand. You know, it's either God, I don't need you, or there's so much shame, God, I can't come to you. <laughs> like, whatever's going to keep us away from God, you know, and that's not good. But God doesn't and won't accuse us. In fact, did you guys catch what Paul says here? He's declared us righteous, justified, just as if you've never sinned. That's who you are in Christ. So the judge has spoken, the Gavin has fallen, not guilty done it's finished it's over so imagine you know saying wait 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 judge you know um (laughs) the gavel's down (laughs) it's it's too late there's nothing to wait on so who can accuse us no one because we are acquitted sheep okay which brings us now to the next question who shall condemn us who is he who condemns us It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Well, if no one has the authority to accuse us, then they surely don't have the power to condemn us. So how do you shut down Satan's condemnations? Um, I remember a film... Clint Eastwood was in a long time ago. A man said, hey, I'm going to hit you with three, with three, in three ways, hard, fast, and continuous. I think as Christians, let's, you know, do four things. I can up that because I have Christ who died, Christ who is risen, or <clears throat> has come back from the dead, who's ascended, and, and he makes intercession for me. <laughs> like, think on that for a second, is being in Christ. Um, so remember, Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. That's what Jesus does. So he had to do it first himself. He rose from the dead. So it gives him not only... And Jesus, the authority, but the authority to judge all of mankind. In John 5, 22, for the Father judges no one, we're told. Who does the judging? But it's committed to, the, to all judgment to the Son. It's Jesus. So to the unbeliever, Jesus is the judge. Okay? To the believer, he's our advocate. He's our defense attorney. Think about that. So what relationship do you have with Jesus? Is he your judge, you know, or is he your advocate? He would never condemn those for whom he died. So Christian, don't be afraid of him, nor try to avoid him. It is Christ that died, and let your confidence be in nothing else. Well, I was dedicated as a baby. No, it is Christ who died. Well, I was baptized. (laughs) No, it is Christ who died. Well, I was confirmed. No, it is Christ who died. Well, I tithe. No, it is Christ who died. Well, I was raised up in the church. No, it is Christ who died. I go on missions trips. No, it is Christ who died. I speak in tongues. No, it is Christ who died. But I go to Freedom Fellowship. (laughs) No, it is Christ who died. So whatever your confidence, guys, put them all away, okay? Keep this one declaration. It is Christ who died, period. Can I get an amen? Amen. Um, so who can condemn us? Not one, not even God, because we are conquering sheep. Think about that, guys. We are more than conquerors because it is Christ who died. It's because of him and what he has done, what he has accomplished. Isn't that cool? 
Can I share with you guys the first time I got to preach? Jamaica, missions trip, 19 years old. I've been in pastoral ministry for 20 years. I got to celebrate that uh, this summer. But the first time I preached was quite the <laughs> event in my life. Um, Jamaica's beautiful. Have you guys been? Isn't it beautiful? You want a mission trip. So you, then you know. You get there, you see the resorts, you see the whole hotels, beautiful beach, the ocean is wonderful. This is awesome. But then you go across the street and you're in the third world. You have Jamaicans without shoes on. That's Jamaica, okay? And when I went, like our sister, it was, it was a mission, okay? So I bought the... <clears throat> reggae hat and all the colorful beads and I got all my good stuff and <laughs> we're ready to go minister and we saw some crazy things okay um, met some young boys who were in prison there was a six-year-old waiting uh, on a murder trial um, they were all enclosed there was one brick that let light into it they didn't have a light inside okay uh, that's all that they got um, <clears throat> stayed in there for weeks on end. Um, anyways, crazy trip. But I remember the evening that I was to teach, uh, preach in a church for the first time ever. Uh, we we're at Christ for the Nations. I'm going to share this part of the story for you, Ozzy. Um, my brother shared something yesterday morning. And when it comes to the spiritual realm, there are things going on that we don't understand, you know. I'm sitting there with my notes in my Bible, and I'm just going over this study over and over again because I wanted to get it right. I've never preached before. I hadn't been to, you know, Bible college or seminary. All I know is the gospel, and I know Jesus, and I wanted to share that with these people that I was going to be preaching to. Well, I'm sitting there, Christ for the Nations, overlooking the bay, and I'm, I skip dinner because I'm going to be spiritual and fast and pray and get ready to preach that night. And I'm sitting there, and <clears throat> there was a demon that jumped on my back and began to choke. I could not breathe. I could not speak. And just to utter the name of Jesus out loud, it was a suffocating thing. It took everything within me, okay? And I spoke the name of Jesus, and this demon, <laughs> gone just like that, okay? But I'm kind of freaking out. It's next level stuff, okay? It's not just, hey, am I going to get my study down right? Do I know what I'm going to say to these people? Hey, spiritually, there's something going on, <laughs> and the enemy doesn't want me preaching. So my first time, I'm just nervous to begin with, and now all this just happened, and we go up the mountain, and we get to this uh, church, and I get to meet the pastors of the church. And we prayed beforehand, and people began to gather. And it took a little while for everybody to get there. We had our worship stuff. And I'm as nervous as I think I've ever been in my entire life. And here, an opportunity to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to this group of believers in Jamaica. I get up, and I begin to preach the gospel that is Christ who died. <laughs> And because he died, we get to live. I don't know exactly what I preached that night, but it was just gospel truth. And I felt the Spirit of God fall upon me, and I'm talking about things I don't even know. And one of the side comments, which I just mentioned, you know, though I speak in tongues and have not love, <laughs> what does it profit me? And I just laid out, you know, hey, it doesn't even matter if you guys speak in tongues or you don't speak in tongues. That doesn't save you. Jesus saves you. Well, I had no idea what this church believed in their doctrines. It was an Assemblies of God church, and they teach that you have to speak in tongues to be saved. Well, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible says you have to have faith in Jesus Christ to be saved. So that's what I was preaching. The Spirit of God just fell. I saw the pastors in the back get up in an uproar and start talking to our leader. I'm just like, you know, sharing the gospel. I'm like, what are they undone about? They're obviously mad about me preaching the gospel. Did I screw up the gospel? You know? <laughs> well, then at the end, we did an altar call, okay? And 
dozens and dozens and dozens of people just kept coming forward. But the first guy who came up to the front walks right up to me because we had to ask the team to come up to pray with people. First guy that walks up, you know, here's this black man. It's like Shaquille O'Neal because he's like over seven feet tall, you know. I'm six foot on a good day. <laughs> so I'm, you know, he, he comes up and I'm looking up at him and, and he asks me, you know, what you said, is it true? That I just have to believe in Jesus Christ. And I'm like, well, according to the Bible, <laughs> that's what it says. But I don't speak in tongues. That was his nest. I'm like, well, I don't know about that I know it doesn't matter. What I do know is, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Have you put your faith in him? This big man just began to weep. And he's like, yes. And he grabbed my hands. And this guy's hands were like, monster claws, you know, and stuff. And we prayed. And he just wept and wept. And after we prayed, he gave me a hug. And he said, thank you so much. I've grown up my entire life being told that I have to be able to speak in tongues to know that God loves me. As the good news of the gospel is God loves you. He loves you. And whoever believes on him, whoever will be saved, that is the gospel. So it's one of those things, guys, we never know what God is up to. (laughs) What we do know is he loves us. And because we have been loved, okay, we get to love others then. And because we're loved by the conquering king, we are more than conquerors. Guys, truth will set us free. And the gospel sheds light into this dark world. The gospel brings light to false teaching. And that's why it's so important that we grasp these truths. Because without the gospel, these things that we've seen as being the sheep of his pasture, <laughs> as his kids, as believers, if the gospel's not true. If it's not central, none of this stuff's going to make sense. None of this stuff can be true. It all comes back to Jesus. So, we are conquering sheep. That's a goofy picture to think of, though. <laughs> You guys ever see sheep? They don't conquer much. You know, they might do in a field pretty good. Hey, we ate a lot of grass today. You know, (laughs) I love sheep. I have a cool sheep video for you guys later. If I forget, remind me. Let's move on. Last part here. What shall separate us? And I love this question, okay? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution or famine or nakedness or peril, uh, peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to create, or sorry, separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So notice the progression, first of all. Bad to worse here, okay? There's a progression that is laid out. Nothing can drive a wedge between God and his people no matter how painful or hard it is. That's the point. There's nothing that can separate us. So it's weird. We often see things on this list as reasons why God is displeased with us, okay? And that's not the point, okay? These aren't love separators. That is not the point of this passage. But we've seen every type of relationship on earth separate, right? That's what we know. That's what we're used to. We see the breakups all the time. Marital separations. There's ugly divorces. Companies split. Even church splits, okay? We see it all the time. We live in a society where dads are separating from their families to go start new ones. We see moms separating from their families because they found someone else. 
business partners are separating over philosophies of doing business. We see friends separating because of other friends. It seems like most relationships we know are kind of like Italian dressing, okay? You can shake it up. Ooh, yummy, you know? Um, But give it a little bit of time, okay? And sure enough, everything separates. But relationship with Christ, guys, I kind of like picturing that as like butter on a warm English muffin. You know what I'm talking So I'm hungry right now. <laughs> you can't separate the two. You can't. Once they're together, it is what it is, okay? And that's us in Christ Jesus. Nothing shall separate us. Nothing. So who might separate Christians from the Lord? Well, the day the Father stops loving the Son is the day that we have to worry that he's going to stop loving us, okay? And we know that's not going to happen. So we're more than conquerors, okay? I circled that on there. I hope you have that circled in your Bible, okay? It's not a cute little saying or thought. It's a fact. So when it tells us in verse 37 that we're more than conquerors, it's... It literally means to keep on conquering to a greater degree, to keep on winning in glorious victory, okay? From glory to glory, we're told in Scripture. So we are conquering sheep, and I think that's quite a picture. We're told in Psalm 100, verse 3, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture, So for him to say, I'm persuaded, okay, if someone asks your persuasion, tell them, I'm persuaded, and then quote verse 38 and 39, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, or principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor the things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow. So seriously, did Paul think he could lose his salvation? Persuaded. I stand convinced. That's what he's saying. Nothing. Nothing. I roll with the Apostle Paul, by the way. I don't think we can lose our salvation because I've been persuaded. I believe Romans chapter 8. I believe God's word so he picks up where he left off in verse 35 okay with death okay and i think that's the thing people dread the most isn't it the death of a loved one dying ourselves isn't that bad i hope you guys aren't tripping as christians it's like woohoo you know glory jesus you're cooler than i thought you know it's gonna be a good day but we don't like the death The thought of losing my wife or my kids or my parents, those are hard things. You guys I love, those would be hard things. And that's where he takes us to the extreme. So Paul chooses the extremes of the elements in God's universe. So he extremes, or he uses the the existence, death and life. And we're told in the scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, 9, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him so the extremes of created spiritual armies okay that would be the angels in the supernatural powers principalities or demons you guys know that those things are very real okay there is a spiritual realm going on okay and sometimes it intersects into our life in our world um so angels Uh, would not, demons could not undo God's relationship with his redeemed ones. That's the point, okay? Well, I've gone so far as to inviting demons, demonic entities into my life to the point of being possessed, okay? And I've seen this firsthand. People possessed by demons themselves, where they have been cast out in the name of Christ Jesus and that person had come to faith in Jesus Christ. Not even a demon who's possessed a person can keep a person from God. Do you guys understand? I mean, look at how many people in the Gospels, in the book of Acts, 
set free and they come to faith in Christ. And some people think they are so far gone. And some people are very open about their possession. There is satanic worship that goes on right here in Kukana. I don't know if you guys know that or not. There's houses that have pentagrams right outside their house to let people know, hey, this is how we roll here. We worship Satan. That's crazy. Can God save that person? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I want to say more on that, but we're not going to. Um, So there's nothing now, because even the extremes of time, whether present or future, he brings up. So nothing now, like he lists in verse 35 for us, or nothing upcoming, okay? So even the extremes in space, whether it's height or depth, okay? Nothing swooping down, nothing coming up that will separate us from his love. And then the extremes of creation, any other created thing, thing he says so nothing in the entire created realm can thwart god's purpose for believers in christ so who can separate us no one you guys getting the point here no one because we are loved sheep we're secure sheep we're advantaged sheep we're acquitted sheep we're conquering sheep and we're loved sheep isn't this a cool passage of scripture why does it have to be all about us it's not we have none of this we are none of these without him it always starts with him and because he is there his results. <laughs> he loves deep theological questions this last week. Because last week we talked about foreknowledge a little bit. And we in our, you know, finite understanding, these three pounds of brain that we have, we try to figure out the infinite God and <laughs> why he has chosen. Why would he create all of this if he knew we would do this and rebel and all this evil, why? And those are, are questions that people struggle with. But it comes back to God is God. <laughs> He's in control. We know what the scriptures do declare about him. He's just, he's fair, he is loving. And I read about these wonderful things. This is beautiful. These are awesome realities. To have this type of security is part of God's creation in Jesus, there is nothing cooler. But it's very easy to go negative and look at all the bad. But look what God does. He is love. (laughs) And he's chosen to love us. Even a world that's in rebelling and falling, he so loved this world. Really? There's so much more to God. And there are things that we're not going to be able to grasp in this life. We can know what we know. And these things have been revealed. These mysteries have been made known to the church for a reason. We have a lot given to us. And we have a hope that is sure. And we have a hope that we get to share with this world. That's pretty cool. So I want to end our time with something I saw this week and something I read this week. And the first is going to be a short video. You guys may have seen this on YouTube or on a news thing. We've been watching a thing called World Watch. Are you guys familiar with that? Yeah. Uh, it's a subscription. I forget what it is, like 70 bucks a year or something. But it's like a, a 10 to 15 minute uh, news uh, video. They just cover events going on, not just here, but all over the world from a biblical view. Love it. Our kids, can we watch another one? Can we watch another one? We fall behind once in a while. But anyways, Um, This was on this last week, and I want to share it with you guys because we were just blown away. Uh, This guy in Australia um, got hundreds and hundreds of sheep, okay? Um, And he's been making these cool things. They're having a drought there right now, okay? Um, But he's been putting out feed. There's actually feed green there, and that's why the, the sheep are flocking the way that they are. But when I saw this in just the reality of being one of God's sheep, 
it just reminded me of how God loves me, how he loves this church. We are the sheep of his pasture. And I want to encourage you guys, you know, because it got me thinking, um, as I've been reading this last week, we're called to love. We want to <laughs> judge. We want to be critical of so much. And I was just amazed, you know, everywhere I was in the scriptures last week, just the command to love. Well, there's God. We know the first command is to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is to do what? Love others as ourselves. That's what we get to do. We get to love, okay? And we as sheep, well, there's got to be more to it, God. You know, there's other things that have to happen, you know. And I think about these guys, you know. <laughs> they were just doing their thing, okay. Eating. We, guys, we do our thing. We love God. And when we're loving God, I think the result of that is loving others. We're just going to be loving. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Right? Nothing. Well, God loves me. <laughs> What's going to stop me from, what, Jesus, you told me to love my enemies? Well, I guess I can do that too because <laughs> you're loving me like crazy. I, I guess I can do the same to others. We just get to love. And that brings me to something I read this week, okay? Uh, it's a question that Andrew Murray once asked, was asked, and it got me provoked thinking this week. He said this, who could predict what blessing might come through those who agree to prove God's promises? The scriptures we read this morning, guys, are these promises from God? Absolutely. I hope you recognize promises when you study the scriptures. Okay? God's word is sure. He's promised us these things as his kids so this gets me thinking, who could predict the blessing that might come through those who agree to prove God's promises? It's one thing to know God's promises. It's a whole other thing to live God's promises. That's on us. That takes trusting, obeying, saying yes, and following, okay? Really following, believing, entering into those promises, so think about this. What we possess in Jesus here deeply impacts how our lives play out now and in eternity. Okay? Big time. So one day, we'll have to answer to him for every opportunity, every gift, and every promise that he's offered to us. Okay? We're not going to be condemned for things that we missed out on but we do get the privilege of partaking and entering into all that he has. And that's what I want to see happen. That's how I pray for you guys as your pastor. I want us to enter into all that God has. Because how we will respond, you know, that's a big question. This is truth this morning. Great Bible study. It is, because it's Romans chapter 8, okay? <laughs> but what do we do with it? Are we going to walk it out? Will our lives work just go up in smoke or will they echo throughout eternity? I don't know about you guys, but we've been given eternal life. Let's live for eternal life. Temporal life is temporal life. And I, let me tell you what, if we're living with the eternal mindset, we will have an impact on the temporal because what are we going to be doing? We're going to be loving. We're going to be bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ into what this temporal world is missing. Amen? So, Father, thank you for your word this morning. We pray and ask that you help us to remember that we are secure sheep, that you are for us, that there are no charges against us, that we no longer live under condemnation, and help us. Simple prayer, Father. Help us to live as more than conquerors as we follow you, the conquering king. Amen? Amen. Awesome. Love you guys. Have a great week.